1 Kings 19, 5 through 9, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. What a great crowd we have, those watching online. Get you on this morning, verse 10 and 11. 1 Kings 19, 5 says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. He did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and said to him, and said, Arise and eat, and because the journey is too great for thee. He rose and did eat and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. He came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, he said unto him, What doest thou? thou hear Elijah. Jeremiah 29 verse 10 and 11 for thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place for I know the thoughts that I think toward you saith the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And so my assignment this morning, uh, my mission is to give you a, a message from the Lord. And, and the que- it's, a, it's a question that I want you to ask yourself, not your neighbor. Don't hope that I preach to the person you hate across the aisle. But let's, let's see if the Lord can preach to you personally. And let's ask ourselves this question. Am I in alignment with my assignment? Am I in alignment with my assignment? Lord Jesus, have your way in this place. Thank you for all the wonderful worship and the atmosphere that's been created. I pray that you would let your word loose into every situation, every battle, every everything going on behind the scenes. I pray that today you would minister and you would move and that there'd be a breakthrough in several situations, not just one or two. I pray you'd have your way in every household, in every dilemma. I worship you and praise you. In Jesus' name, would you clap your hands to the Lord one more time? And the words you're all waiting for, you may be seated. (laughs) I heard someone yell, thank you. Except for me, apparently. God speaks from the end and works his way to the beginning. What I mean by that is God always starts way ahead of us. And works his way back to us. We are not like that. We work from the current into the future. God works from the future back to the current. Creation shows us that. He started each day in the evening. We start our days in the morning. But God started his days at night and finished in the morning. His word said that he knows the thoughts that he thinks toward us. And their thoughts of peace and not of evil to give us an expected end, or in the Hebrew, the end that we hope for, Brother Reyes. That's the thought of God, to give us the end that we hope for. Now, you'll find in Hebrews that the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when you have faith for God to do something and you think that's your faith and you hope God does it, the truth of the matter is it's a thought from God that came to you that you're now faith for for something to happen at the end of the situation. That is how it really is going on. We take the credit saying, I have faith for it. I hope God comes through when the truth is you only have faith for it because God dropped the thought into your situation and you're thinking about it and now you believe it and the whole time it was the will of God to give it to you when it was over. Because his thoughts are above your thoughts. His ways are above my ways. And so when God starts thinking of something or doing something for someone, he does it from the end to the beginning. The problem with us is we have to filter his voice through our current dilemmas and our current circumstances. And we try to force God to talk to us about what we're really going through right now. And that's how God gets silent on people. When you try to control the conversation with God, 
God and you demand that God only talks to you about what you're asking him for, God will go silent every single time because he does not fit into my dilemma. He fits in my destiny. He speaks from my assignment, not my circumstance. And if I have to have him talk to me every day about my circumstance, it's going to get quiet. If you're shut up, if you're frustrated with God because he's not answering a prayer that you're asking over and over, he's trying to tell you, leave that in my hand and start praying about what I've called you to be and performing what I've called you to do. Because he speaks from destiny and we try to control him. So we, we try to somehow, come on, God, talk to me about this. And, and he will go silent every time. He, he speaks from what he's called you to do. You'll never be more fulfilled than when you're doing what he's called you to do. You were created to do something in the kingdom. And when you're doing exactly what you were created to do, you will feel fulfillment in your life. If you're not feeling fulfillment, you're probably not performing what you were created to do. And so he'll say things like, to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. Why? That was his destiny. Don't know what Jonah was praying the day before, but I promise you it wasn't, can I go to Nineveh? Because we know how Jonah reacted when destiny showed up. When he called Ezekiel in captivity. Ezekiel wants to be delivered. He wants to be free. He's a slave. But God said, can these bones live? I don't know. What does that have to do with me? What about Samuel, the little boy who's an orphan at the temple, living with an old blind preacher? Mom dropped him off. The first time God ever speaks to Samuel, you'd think he would say, hey, bub, it's okay. You're going to be all right. I'm the Lord. I'm going to be here with you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to use you mightily. No. Behold, I do a new thing in Israel. What? What does it have to do with me being an orphan? Nothing. I speak from your destiny, not your dilemma. Take off your shoes, Moses. You're standing on holy ground. I haven't said a word to you for 40 years about what you're going through, but when I show up, I instantly speak life to where you're headed, not what you're running from. Someone needs to realize if you want to start hearing God, get in alignment with your future and not with your past. Get in alignment with what God wants to do through you, not what you've done wrong, not what you've let down, not who you've let down. Get in alignment with the future of your destiny. Oh, so he says... uh, to us when we're when we're when we're praying and we're and we feel like doing something great in the kingdom of God we feel something maybe it's missions maybe it's teaching a bible study maybe it's sacrificing maybe it's fasting or praying or ministering we feel this unction come upon the reason why we feel that it's because destiny or assignment is connected to it and when we start looking at everything that's not right Everything that is going against us and everything that could be better and could be different. And if we only had this and we only had that, then we disconnect ourselves from our assignment and we start staring at circumstance. And it's quiet. Because that's when we leave worship and start worrying. We start to see things from a distorted lens and now we're no longer expecting God to do something amazing in our life we're just trying to survive Elijah breaks onto the scene connected to assignment connected to destiny and that's why he was so fulfilled in the beginning of his ministry because he knew he had an anointing to do unprecedented things for God he would call down rain stop the rain call down fire first person to ever raise somebody from the dead was Elijah he was a anointed to do things no one had ever seen no one had ever done and when you are doing the will of God you will see things that no one's ever seen because if you're really living in the perfect path
pattern of his will for your life, you will step into unprecedented favor that you cannot look back on and find a script for because God is showing you how destiny works for you. He just doing this crazy stuff for God, and, and nobody can stop him. He's anointed. He's got fire in his hands. He's, he's anointed to do anything he wants. People were scared of him. Kings would not come near him because he was that dangerous in the spirit. And the only one hell could find brave enough to attack Elijah was a woman by the name of Jezebel. I told the congregation this morning, you won't find many people naming their daughter that. We think names are no big deal. How come no one names their son Judas and no one names their daughter Jezebel? Jezebel is from a pagan nation. She hates the people of God. She silences them. She forces them into caves and she keeps them hidden and she kills anything that stands against her. And now there's this crazy preacher who's not afraid of her and he's coming up and in her kingdom and he's speaking against it. He's killing the prophets of Baal. He's having revival no one's ever had before. And she said, I've got to figure out how to disconnect him from destiny and put him back into dilemma because that's the assignment of the demon in your house to get you out of destiny mindset to get you away from thinking God can do anything and get you back into I'm suffering no one cares about me where's God is there any help and we, are we going to make it through this when you're talking like that you are repeating the strategy of hell in your house I'm preaching to you right now and all of a sudden he 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 hears the threat from her someone sends him a letter the threat as she wrote the letter it said tomorrow by this time I will cut your head off love Jezebel XO XO can you imagine going on a date with her hey babe I'm not gonna make it tonight oh you aren't I'm gonna write you a letter you'll be there like, you're a freak. Get away from me. She's nuts. She sent I me mean, that her love letters involve people dying. Just read the letters of Jezebel in the Bible. There was always someone getting killed. Like, you would never want a letter from her. I just wrote you a note. No, thanks. I'm good. She writes him a letter saying, I'm going to kill you. Now, we all know this is revelation that everybody preaches, but... That's not, she's not telling the truth because had she the power to kill him, she wouldn't send a letter. She would send a sword, but she had no power to perform that which she threatened. There you see the pattern of the demonic. If they do not have access to do what they're threatening, then they hope you believe the lie and become paralyzed with fear and therefore step into dilemma because something threatened you. If they've been told yes by God that they're allowed to attack you and they have access to your house, they don't threaten you. They they just show up and cause a storm. They show up and go crazy because they've been told, yes, by God, I can trust this child with this trial. But if hell has been told no by the master of the universe, the only thing left for the devil to do is show up and threaten that which he wants to do, but shut up, but not allowed to do. And if you believe the threat, and you go back into the dilemma. Oh, man, we're going to fall apart. We're going to lose everything. Why are you saying those things? Because I'm hearing a threat. And Elijah, this bad preacher who can do anything, he's literally the most powerful man on the planet. He believes the lie and disconnects himself from all the stuff that destiny has and runs into the desert of dilemma. Are you with me? And he goes out there and runs historians. Some say 90 miles. Some say 45 miles. But most agree it was a lot of miles that he ran into the desert and finally finds a juniper tree, lays underneath it, and asks the Lord, let me die. How does the guy that once said God can raise the dead now asks God to take my life from me? 
The one who had faith to raise someone who actually was dead is now praying, God, let me die. How does a child of God go from faith when they first step into the kingdom and God can do anything and God delivers them from some kind of crazy life and horrible issues and terrible home life and they come in and they know he's able to do anything. Just a few trials later, they're saying, well, I hope I can make it. Well, I better get a word. I can't take it one more Sunday. I can't take it one more week. You came out of drugs. You came out of prison. You came out of a psych ward. You came out of the deepest part of the world. You came out of the gutters of sin. And now you're trying to say, well, it's quiet in here. Oh, well, God, if you really cared, I wouldn't be going through this. As if somehow the pattern in the Bible has been, if you, and this is, this is to prove people don't read the Bible. When you start to pray like this, this is a signal to a preacher, you don't read. Because if you read the pattern, if you're really in the kingdom, you get punched in the face all the time. That's just my way of saying it. I mean, Jesus died on a cross at 33. John died at 30. The disciples were executed. There's always constant war. If you're doing it right, something's fighting you. If you're doing it wrong, nothing will be. If it's always comfy and cozy and sweet and rosy, then the devil's probably not bothered by your prayer life. But if you're trying to step into destiny and be something that you never were, he's going to hate you because you're not satisfied where you are sitting, pursuing something. So the Lord hears Elijah say, let me die. And I told him this morning, I can give you proof. He did not want to die. He's lying. Because the Bible said he was under a juniper tree. If you're really wanting to die, why are you trying to get shade? Isn't that revelatory? If you're really quitting, why are you trying to chill? You know, we pray, and now we laugh at that, and we do the same thing. I can't take it one more day. Then why are you at church? If you're really quitting, this is the last place. I'll wait on the, the people that are sleeping in the back here. This is the last place that you will show up to if you're really quitting. Because if you're really quitting, you're walking away from anything about this. But if you're in here, it's because something in you says, I want to be revived no matter what I'm going through. There's something in me that believes if I get in that sanctuary, if I get under the juniper tree, I'll find shade from what I'm going through in this desert. Huh. Sorry, if you're in the back, I'm not making fun of you. There's people in the front not moving either. I wish Brother John was here. Y'all would straighten up. <laughs> Cats away, the mice will sleep. <laughs> Ooh, oops, sorry, not really. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, he's praying things like, let me die. And you would think God would deal with the dilemma. Hey, Elijah, don't worry about Jezebel. She's not going to get you. You're going to be all right. I'm going to come through. I'm going to take care of her. She's crazy, but I'm bigger than she is. You just hang in there. Don't be worried about it. He doesn't say one word about the dilemma. He sends an angel that likes to cook. What does this have to do with anything I'm going through? There are chef angels, apparently, in the Bible. I did not know this, but there are chef angels and Elijah wakes up under the tree, and there's this, this being. Apparently, he started a fire. He's got coals. He's got cake and water. Here, I need you to go help Elijah. What does he need? He needs a cake. And I need you to get some coals, water. What? Is he starving? Nope. And... You, if you read the word like I do, I, I, I dig into it. I read it and read it and read it until I see what I don't see, okay? And so then I realize it says he put the water by Elijah's head. So when Elijah woke up, there was this water right in his face. 
You know why he did that? He did that because he was trying to remind Elijah, not just strengthen him. There was a time when Elijah went to a widow's house, didn't have any food, said, make me a cake and get me some water. And God brings the exact thing to him that God performed before. Why? Because he's trying to remind his child, if I took care of you then. I know we think that's cute. But if you remember what he's done for you personally, I could put the mic down and leave and you'd have a shouting service. Because if you really remember what he's done, you don't need me to preach you into a fit. You already know, had it not been for the Lord that was on my side, I wouldn't even be in the sanctuary. Somebody give God some specific praise right now. I mean, I'm talking about you've got a memory in your mind, and you know the Lord did that. That should have killed me. That should have taken me out. But God brought me through, and God brought me out. I still like the old song. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon the rock. I think it's okay to praise him right now. I think we ought to break that, that weariness right there and begin to celebrate a little bit. You know what's so crazy? The neighbor that's beside you is not shouting about what you're shouting about. <laughs> but what you're shouting about is something specifically God did for you. And that's why the body is so beautiful. Because everybody has their own testimony of the goodness of the Lord. That's why we come to church. This is why we're here right now. Because we all know where we were, who we were, what we were, and with whom we were when God found us. If someone ever tells you, if you're a new convert, and someone walks up and says, I found the Lord back in 83, they didn't find no one. They don't, you didn't find God. God found you. Like, and I, uh, every elder's with me on this. I already know this. But no one found. You can't get wise enough, spiritual enough, intelligent enough, hungry enough to find God. God went looking for you. God found you. God found me. It's his mercy. That's the reason we are here. So he said, I want you to cook a meal for him. And I've told, I think I told you before, I told him this morning, but, but a secret to God that we all need to understand is anytime there's provision, there will be protection. Provision and protection come hand in hand. What I mean by that is, is if God provides, he plans on protecting. And if God protects, he plans on providing, okay? Samson, I'm going to give you a jawbone to fight a thousand Philistines with. I'm going to protect you with that. And when you're done killing all thousand of them, water's going to come out of the same jawbone because I'm going to provide, okay? Elijah, if I'm providing food for you, I'm going to protect you from Jezebel. What are you preaching? If the car coming through the intersection that should T-bone you and you scream Jesus and somehow misses you and you say thank you for the protection, you're only giving him half the praise that you should be praising him for. Because if he protected you, provision must be around the corner. So next time something should take you out and God blocks it. Don't just say thanks for looking out for me, but thank you for providing too because if you're protecting me, you're going to provide for me. And if you're providing for me, you're going to protect me as well. Somebody ought to praise him right now. I dare you to ignore your neighbor and worship your God. If he's providing, he's going to take care of the things scaring you. And if he's protecting, don't you worry about the money. He's going to provide for you as well. That's somebody's word right there, and you believe it, but someone ought to receive it right now. I receive the word. I receive the word. I receive the word. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost starting to move. Somebody had been believing a lie, but their eyes are open right now. God's not done protecting you, and he's not done providing for you. Arise and eat, what the angel said.
And Elijah gets up, and he eats the food, some of it, and goes back to sleep. Now, this is about the ultimate story where you can think of the word rude. It's like you're being rude to someone who came from heaven, like who could kill you. He's cooking food, but he could cook you. Like, there's stories in the Bible where angels did that. You know, they're, like, really tough. I ain't afraid. Yeah, whatever, homie. One angel killed 185,000 soldiers in one night. Hello, I'm here. You're dead. He's cooking. Elijah says, I don't want all of it. I'm good. Goes back. How? It's not that he's rude that bothers me. How do you go back to sleep with an angel standing in front of you? If you wake up tonight, and at the foot of your bed, there's an angel with like a chef hat on. I made you this cake. Here's some water. I bet you don't go, oh, thanks. Good night. See you tomorrow. Protect my house. I bet you will wake up and go, what is going on around here? It's not even my birthday. What's the cake for? Aren't carbs bad for me? Like what? Apparently God is not on the, di- the keto stuff. <laughs> He's like, eat the carbs, bro. Someone just got delivered right there. They're like, I knew God was trying to call me off this diet. <laughs> that's, my, that's someone else's word. They're like, went straight to the burger joint. I'll have a bun this time. <laughs> Help me, Lord. I'm getting way off. (laughs) Elijah, he's like, good night, goes back to sleep. And apparently the angel had to go all the way back to heaven because the Bible said he came a second time. So he, he flies all the way down. That's a long flight, guys. All the way down to earth, makes the cake, water, makes the fire, gets rejected, flies all the way back to heaven, and God says, "Mm, go back. What? That guy didn't even eat it. He ate some of it and went to sleep. The rudest prophet I've ever seen. And God says, go back. And I asked the Lord, why did you send the angel back when Elijah rejected the provision in the first place? And he said to me, very simply, I would have sent him seven times. That's all he said. I said, what do you mean seven times? He said, in the chapter prior, Elijah chased me seven times. There was no sign of rain, and the servant kept speaking doubt, and Elijah said, go seven times. I believe if we keep chasing God long enough, he'll come through. And he said, you'll never chase me more than I'll chase you. That would mean you're hungrier for me than I am for you. So if you ever start pursuing God... Guess what? When you want to quit, when you want to walk away, when you want to backslide, you might think you're doing a good job, but you're going to be chased, sweetheart, the rest of your ever-loving life because he's not in the business of letting you just bail and say, well, there she goes. If she goes, God's coming after. That's why you shouldn't believe the report of the lost loved one. They might be acting a fool, but if God ever saw them in this altar, then you better know God's got something on there trail and it's chasing them. You ought to praise the Lord for an upcoming miracle in a family situation that you can't even make happen, but there's a chasing God in the atmosphere. Bible says the angels, he, David pray angels chase them. You ought to pray for the angels to start chasing your loved ones. That will be fun for them. You're going to get some calls. I had the craziest dream. Oh, did you? Tell me about it. Because when God chases, he doesn't stop. And this time the angel says, arise and eat. But then he makes a statement. For the journey is too great for thee. He didn't say, because Jezebel is too close to thee. He said, the journey, the future is so far. Journey is so far. That's what it means in the Hebrew. So far. It's so big 
that you're not going to be able to get to it with your own strength. It's going to be, it's going to take God's strength to do what you're getting ready to do. Doesn't mention anything about what's chasing you, what you've come out of. What wants to destroy? I'm preaching to somebody. What wants to take you out? Because God already knows if that could have taken you out, you wouldn't be in the service right now. Yeah. So you're worrying about something that's never going to get you. But if you could see what destiny is saying. He said, I see something in your future. You're going to anoint this guy to be a king over this nation. This guy to be a king in that nation. You're going to anoint this guy to be a prophet. In other words, you've got world-changing anointing inside of you. Your destiny is bigger than you think it is. And so Elijah goes on a 40-day fast. And he comes to Mount Horeb, and I'm hurrying. He comes to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, the only person before Elijah to ever fast 40 days is Moses. Moses fasted 40 days on Mount Horeb, on the top of the mountain. He and God talked. God showed him his hinder parts or his past or creation. That's where Moses wrote the book of Genesis because he saw the creation. God showed him his past, and Moses got to see it. That's why you know about everything in creation is Moses fasted 40 days and climbed a mountain and God revealed it to him. So Elijah is on the same mountain that Moses saw creation, that Moses got the Ten Commandments, that Moses saw the glory of God. He is in the same, same atmosphere, on the same fast, same type of consecration, same mountain, same God. But somehow Elijah bails halfway up the mountain and enters into a cave. Oh, this will preach. Why did one guy go to the top and say, show me your glory, show me everything? And the other guy said, I just want to die. I'm no better than my father's. And goes and repeats what he said in the desert in the cave. They're on the same, con they're, both, they're both consecrated. These are, these are spiritual people. The difference is one that's consecrating is looking to the future. Show me what I've never seen. And the other one's looking at the past. I can't ever be better than what they were. And if you're staring at dilemma, even while you're consecrating, you're headed toward a cave. Well, I know we're not going to shout about that, but I want you to let that sink in. If you demand details about the current problem and you're still fasting for it, you're still going to end up in a cave. Fasting, if for it to have permanent results has to be combined with faith for something you've not seen or something you expect God to do. That's why you see great results in fasting if you fast with faith. And if you fast out of trying to figure out details, you will end up in a cave of discouragement. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so God comes by the cave, stirs up a little wind. The Bible said God was not in the wind. This is funny. I was preaching. I'm not going to say where. It was in this state somewhere <laughs> a long time ago. And I read that, those verses about when there was a wind, and then some guy yelled out, Holy Ghost wind. And I said, and the Lord was not in the wind. He said, no, he wasn't. <laughs> and I said, and there was an earthquake. Holy Ghost earthquake. I said, and the Lord was not in the earthquake. No, he wasn't. And I said, and there was a fire. Holy Ghost fire. He started shouting. I said, and the Lord was not in the fire. No, he wasn't. And I was like, and there was a still small voice, and he literally yelled out, and it wasn't God. I said, no, that was God. <laughs> and after the service is over, I'm leaving the revival. Thank you. We're not connecting here. <laughs> Every time I read that text, I literally think I cannot help it. Anyway, help me. I'm sorry. I'm dwelling on my dilemmas here. And so... The Bible says the Spirit of God passed by. There was this wind, and Elijah's not even phased by it. He's just sitting in that dark cave. Wind comes up. Whoosh. He's like, big deal. Earthquake. If you're in a cave, and there's an earthquake, I think you might be afraid. I lived in Alaska my entire life growing up. When the ground can split open, you're standing one foot here, and there's a crack in the ground. Yeah, they get your attention. He's not even phased by it. And then a, a wildfire breaks out, and he's just watching. 
and he's not moved. And the reason none of these things are moving him is because he is used to seeing activity in the elements. He's used to rain stopping, rain coming, fire falling out of heaven. So when you think you've seen God do everything he can do, everything you see just reminds you of things he's already done, and you don't get excited about it anymore. What do you mean? There are people in this room that are hearing the same message that someone else is hearing, and the person beside them is excited about it, but this message is reminding them of a message they heard 28 years ago. And so it's not moving them. Listen, can I help someone? Anytime you start putting God in your little box that I've seen him do every miracle he can do, I've seen every message, I've heard every message, I've heard every detail, I've seen the pattern of how he blesses, and you almost have a, a way of checking the list. Well, this didn't happen. If God's going to bless, he, he always does it this way. Guess what? You are about to be blindsided by what God can do. Because the second he picks up on the fact that you've put him in your dilemma box, he goes out of the way. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not coming to that. You get out of the cave and let me be God and let me do things you can't fathom me doing. And I'll show you things you've never seen. But if you always have the answer of how I'm going to come through, why should I show up and do That makes you God. That makes you the source of the, and you're worshiping your own mind. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. But when you say, I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where, but he's going to come through somehow. I, it could be this way. It could be that. The tumor could disappear. They could do surgery. It could be chemo. I don't know. But God said, when it's over, he's going to give me the end. That is saying, God... You're the God of my destiny. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He never heard the voice of God before. He always heard the word of the Lord come to him. And this time the Bible says, the voice of God spoke to him, what doest thou here? And you've got to understand that no matter what the enemy and what type of cave they push you into, you've got to see things from the spirit side and not the flesh. If you see it from the flesh, you'll always live in fear. You'll always live in worry and anxiety and panic and of being afraid. But if you see it from the spirit, you know that no weapon that's formed against you is able to prosper. And if God before you Somebody ought to know that verse. If God be for you, who can be against you? Who can be against you? I told them this morning. Remember when David was up there facing that Hulk, Goliath, 10 feet tall, and Goliath is talking trash, and he's like, am I a dog that you sent a kid with a stick to fight me? And David said, you know, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. I come to you in the name. I always preach that, you know, you come to me with, I come to you in. And, and your protection's with you. My protection's all man. It makes every, most, most places shout. And, and when, David, <laughs> when David said that, he looks at Goliath. And then he says, and this day I will take your head from you. Okay, here's the problem with that. David has no sword. He's prophesying, I'm going to cut your head off, and he has no knife. But David saw Goliath's sword. Ready? And David assumed, whatever you're attacking me with becomes mine when I beat you. See, Dilemma says, oh, please don't hurt me with the sword. But Destiny says, when I'm done killing you, your sword will be mine. And so I understand that if I see it from Destiny, you're not going to take me out through Dilemma. What does that mean, preacher? That means if, if depression is saying, I'm going to take you out, you look back at depression and say, when this is over, I'll deliver people bound by depression. If it's fear, when this is over, I'll lay my hands on people that are afraid, and God will deliver them. When this is over, I'll lay my hands on people with arthritis, and God will heal them. When this is over, I'll speak, and other marriages will be made whole. I'll pray for other kids that are back. Whatever it is that's coming against you, it's just a resource that's coming in your future, and you've got to see it from your destiny and not from your dilemma. 
Somebody ought to praise him for the attack right now. You ought to praise him for what you're going through. Because when you come out of it, you're going to have resources you didn't have when you went. Close with this. Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost. In fact, that's why the Bible said David shouted for the battle. We only shout for the victory. That's why we don't see very many. Mic drop. We shout after we have proof. This person was healed. Ah! This person got the Holy Ghost. Ah! What if we said this person's going to get the Holy Ghost? Stare down. This person's going to be healed. We'll see. Because we only shout. Y'all can, y'all, I guess y'all come to the front. I guess I'm done. Y'all let me know when I'm done preaching. I'll be calling Bishop about that. Oops. He said, I'm going to shout for the battle. I expect a fight. I'd rather fight than keep sitting here thinking about what's hovering over my brothers, mocking my family. Goliath's been there 40 days, and we're paralyzed with fear. I'm, I'm excited because something's going to happen. I may not survive it, but I'm going to shout because I'm no longer going to sit in the cave wondering and worrying myself to death. Is there anyone that's sick and tired of sitting in the cave? You need to shout for the battle. I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe God's going to bless me when I come out of this. I believe God's going to anoint me when I step out of my fear and step out of my anxiety and step out of my panic and step out of my worry. I believe God will cause me to step into favor when I step out in faith. Stay standing. I'm done. Oh, we're going to talk, homie. There's nothing that God cannot do for you if you step out of the dilemma mindset, out of the circumstances overwhelming, and into the assignment. What can God do if you go big? I'm waiting for the cave dwellers. I'm waiting for the whisper of that word to get to the darkest place of the cave in this room. What can God do if you step out of that darkness? I told them this morning, and I close with this, that seven and a half years ago on a 40-day fast, after that fast ended, I saw thousands receive the Holy Ghost, thousands baptized, the dead raised, all kind of miracles. And it was ridiculous revival across this nation. I thought everybody would be happy. All the church people were happy. Preachers weren't happy. All of a sudden, preachers got mad and attacked me. They liked me when I just preached cute sermons. But when I started stepping in the desk, they started shooting at me. And I thought, well, you know what? To keep them from shooting, I better go back to preaching the cute sermon. Because my goodness, I don't want people mad at me for saying God can raise the dead. And I started looking for why they weren't approving rather than what's God assigning me to do. It's very dangerous when we start getting away from the assignment of God and start looking at the approval of man. So God told me a year and a half ago that he was going to do citywide crusades in America and pour out his spirit in big cities in America. And I built a packet, called several superintendents, and had several cities last year in 2020 lined up for crusades all across this nation. And, and then COVID came. And city by city, San Diego, Kansas City, Chicago, Miami, Tampa, Milwaukee, cities that were planning these all call. Sorry, we can't, we can't do it. It's crazy. It's everything's on lockdown. Everything's on lockdown. Everything's on lockdown. And I went to deep depression. I thought we were going to do something big, God. I thought that was destiny. And then I started whining, and then I got COVID. That really worked out well. And so for 10 days of the worst migraine possible and ice in my lungs and I can barely breathe and my wife is sick also four little kids no one to help us and and I'm laying there halfway through and I said God where are you don't you care about us 
And this is what he said. Now I'm expecting him to say, hey, Josh, I've got you. You'll be all right. You're going to make it through. I'm always there. Lo, I am with you all. This is what he said. In the next seven years, I will pour out my spirit in North America like I never have. That's all he said. And I said, uh, what does that have to do with my migraine? Nothing. We're talking about the migraine that you're going to remove, you know, the one that I can't see. Nothing. He stopped talking. I tried to make him talk about the COVID. He wouldn't talk about it. But when I came to, Wisconsin called and said, you know the Milwaukee crusade we wanted to do? Yeah, we want to do one bigger than that. We're going to use Milwaukee as the base, but we want a crusade that it's the entire state. We're going to take it, half the churches are going to come to Milwaukee and half are going to live stream 80 churches at one time for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I said, okay. So we started getting a team together. We started working hours and hours and hours the last several weeks. And we were like, we were trying to find a church big enough to maybe 1,000, 2,000 people. So we get in them. And so we church after church after church after church after church kept saying no, no, no. And finally one guy showed up at the meeting one night, Zoom meeting, and he said, why don't we go for an arena? And I was like, uh, because we can't even get a church. <laughs> He's like, why don't we do it? Maybe our vision isn't big enough for what God wants to do. I'm going to call the Panther Arena, he said, which is the Milwaukee Bucks old basketball stadium. And I said, go for it, bro. He called and said, told them what was going on. They said, we'd love to house your crusade. Here's the fee. And we were like, ooh, 34000 for this, 10000 for this, $50,000. And we're like, I was like, oh, Lord, no one's going to go for this. This is really you, God. They said, come up to our district conference in Wisconsin, and we're going to see what happens at the district conference. We took the microphone. They gave us five minutes to speak faith over the district for crusade. In five minutes, they raised $130,000. The arena is reserved. Not only that, several churches, not in the United Pentecostal Church, are bringing their entire congregations 10 apostolic churches, 7 Spanish churches, 3 Trinitarian churches have said they're coming. It's all over the radio in Wisconsin. You're patty cake like this. The arena seats 12,000 people. Something is happening in the air where God says, I want someone to believe in destiny and not just the dilemma. Apostolic Youth Corps of the United Pentecostal Church we're going to go overseas this summer. They got shut down. 40 of the young people are coming to Milwaukee the weekend of the crusade. And they're going to blitz the streets of Milwaukee. Everything breathing in that area. They're going to drag into the building. God is going to pour out his spirit like he never has in that state. Because destiny is looking for someone to say, I believe. Use me. Use me, God. Let me see what you... I want you to ask yourself, are you in alignment? Are you doing everything you were created to do? Are you going big? Oh, it's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to kill the altar call. But I feel a witness of a current of the Holy Ghost right behind me right now. Are you doing everything? Or are you floating? Are you an intercessor that's been storming the gates of hell lately? Or are you an intercessor that's been too worn out to pray? Are you a Bible study teaching soul making disciple making machine that's doing it? Or are you one of those that's just too discouraged to look? Are you still that missionary God told you you were going to be when you were 12? I hear assignments dropping all over the room. I hear the voice of the assignment. Here's the secret. I preached my guts out to tell you all this. Here's the secret. If you'll agree to the destiny, and you'll pray about destiny, and you'll focus on destiny, he'll take care of the dilemma. 
If you'll focus on the destiny, he'll stare your dilemma down until it doesn't matter the way it's mattering. Is there anyone that will be honest and say, I've been, ta- I've been thinking about my dilemma too much. If, you, if you'd be honest, if you've been worried about the, the, the circumstance, would you raise your hand? You got, you've been worried about the dilemma way too much. Would you make a move toward the Lord right now? Would you make a move toward the Lord and say, God, I, I, you got to forgive me. I'm sorry for being so focused on what was bothering me. I'm sorry for the way I've talked to you, the way I've prayed, the way I've doubted. And God, I'm, I'm renewing myself. Someone ought to repent right now and say, God, forgive me for focusing on the dilemma. Here I am. I'm signing up for my destiny. I'm signing up for my assignment. Altars open. Somebody ought to bust a move on the devil tormenting you and say, no, 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 no. I'm not a failure. I'm not pathetic. I'm not dying in this dilemma. I'm not dying in this mess. I'm not dying in this trouble. I'm stepping out toward what God wants me to be. God, can I do it? Give me one more shot. Give me one more chance. Give me one more prayer meeting. Give me one more altar call. Give me one more moment. There's a breakthrough in here right now. Give me one more moment with you, God. Somebody's breaking through. I can feel it all over the building. People are breaking through. There's a breakthrough. That's your signal that the destiny's still breathing. Breakthrough. It's the signal that destiny He's still alive.